Hi, my name is Yumi Steins and I woke up so excited this morning because what an immense privilege to join Richard Tognetti to talk about the latest ACO's studio cast. Sitting next to me, Richard. Hello. Yumi. Congratulations on Love and Transfiguration. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the support. Um, so my understanding is this is three main pieces of music on the theme of Love and Transfiguration. So Transfiguration traditionally is about something changing into a more holy, more beautiful or more spiritual version of itself. Acceptance, yep. forgiveness, mm -hmm. finding light where there might be darkness. Um, that's Vox Amoris by the Latvian composer Peter Svarsks and I would argue that is Verklärte Nacht, Transfiguration by Arnold Schoenberg as well. As it's well. accepting. So the well, pieces you just named are the, the first They're the and two last. main pieces. Yeah. So they're, they're very similar in structure, as in both of them are fantasies, what we call fantasies in, in musical language, as in they seem to be like Virginia Woolf, stream of consciousness, but of course they're highly structured. And their one movement works, and they're about the same length. Uh, so there are lots of similarities. They're written for strings. <laughs> um, one was originally, the Verklärtenacht, the Schoenberg was originally a sextet, but he arranged it for strings. And so there's a lot of similarity in, in, in those terms, and they're, they're about um, relationships. And so they're the main works. And then in between we have J.S. Bach's greatest composer who ever lived, according to anyone, Richard Tonietti. According to me, <laughs> but according to... You're in a minority if you know anything about music and you don't accept that J.S. Bach is. Is that Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo combined mm. and Rembrandt. Let's go back though, Richard, um, to the first moments of this studio cast. It's black and it's dead silent. And then in you walk, a man alone. When I was told to do it, I felt like I was in a Western somehow, I don't know. The boots. The dramatic yeah. entrance. Mm. Um, so my understanding of the Vasque's music, Vox Amoris, is it's a love story. Mm. And there are two lovers played, the characters are played by the violin and the, the rest of the strings. Mm. Um, and there's conflict and resolution. There's moments of solitude mm. and moments of kind of scratchy angst. You can find music to be a portal to anywhere. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to listen to it as a conversational relationship between two lovers. Um, and obviously when you hear the scratchy bits as in the high drama and the tension, you need that in, in order to find resolve. The feeling I get from watching the Australian Chamber Orchestra bring this music to life with you at the helm is that Vasque is trying to say something that can't mm. be said with words. Absolutely. So we're, we're wasting you, our time. Look, no, we're not wasting our time because we want to, we want to find with our very clumsy um, vocabulary. Um, when we think in music, it's, it's much more up there, isn't it? It's far loftier. Do, do people call this tricky, this piece? Look, I, everything is tricky to bring off. Um, what we say in musical terms, uh, well, you can hide behind the virtuosity a bit. Um, it is tricky, yeah. It's tricky here and you've got to really feel it. Now, by that, I mean that you can't just put it on auto. There's something about the tonal qualities that you've got to capture in order to bring the music alive. But Mozart for me is still, it was a cliche when I was growing up that Mozart was amongst the hardest composers to perform and he still is. I test myself, I play a Mozart violin concerto in certain situations. Can you show me what you mean? Yeah, I won't be able to play it now. But, mm. Now, in my mind, that's one of the hardest phrases. I kind of played it okay. I'm not warmed up, right? 
but one of the hardest phrases to pull off in a concert. And I deliberately play it without practicing in certain um, looser concerts. But I know that if I get up in front of a, an, the ACO and play it in a proper concert, if I haven't practiced really hard um, to nail it, then I'm running some risks. Whereas the Vasques, even though it's really difficult, you know, lots of fingers moving like this. It's super hyper virtuosic music, so you can kind of hide a bit behind it. Right. Whereas Mozart, just every note. But emotionally, with Vasques, you've really got to be in the music. So you can't play it coolly. I think with each studio cast I've watched, I see a different Richard, mm -hmm. different RT. Um, and in this one, when you walk in and you start to move, it's the magician, mm. Richard. Do you gather something up to be that guy? Well, look, that's a good question. That's a bit, uh, that actors ask themselves that all the time. Yeah, we've got to gather ourselves up and you have to gear yourself up. Yeah, it's not like just, um, as soon as we feel that, oh, everything's fine, it won't be. <laughs> so, Love and Transfiguration, Vasks first. Would it be disrespectful to call Bach a palate cleanser in between? Well, sometimes the palate cleansers are the best parts of the meal. It's definitely a shift, isn't it, going from Vasks to Bach? Well, it's not a nam prick. It's, um, yeah, it's, it, it, I don't mind it being called a, a palate cleanser because we know what that means. So, but it's no little sorbet either. My father gave me the gift of great access to great movies through the Wollongong University, highly illegal probably in now, nowadays because there were no ratings. I, I watched Deliverance when I was 11. I watched Equus. Lots of Culloden, the Battle of Culloden, all quiet on the Western Front, and Solaris. And I, I, I'll never forget the impact of the organ. Actually, it's not just pure Bach. It's a remix by a Soviet um, electronica composer. Um, and, uh, but I'll never forget the impact of Tarkovsky's use of the music Ich ruf zu dir, played on an organ at the end of this film. It's absolutely extraordinary. Well, you know that what's extraordinary really when you think about 11-year-old you having his mind blown and then playing it years later mm. on strings. It's just incredible. It's transcendental and, you know, it's got one of the, the most exquisite melodies. And... It's just, I don't know what it is. He, he's, it's auriferous. Is that the right word? I don't he know what that gold, means. Makes gold. It sounded to me like yearning, like the human yearning mm. for... Yeah. I don't know what, for, yeah, for yes. something bigger than of us. Of course, absolutely. Is that kind of, like, I feel like, is that part of, is that at the heart of a lot of classical music? Classical music? Yeah. I think it's at the heart of all music. No, yeah. I don't think so. Yeah, yearning for your baby. <laughs> You're an implicit Good. nubbin? Is that yeah, what you mean? Absolutely. But that's not exalted. Rick James? No, but it's not exalted, but there are different levels of it. But I think yearning for your baby is a pretty universal thing. That's what Bach is about. Absolutely. Mm. Let's go to the third and final piece in Love and Transfiguration, the Schoenberg, Transfigured Night, mm. based or inspired by a poem. In the poem, a pregnant woman confesses that her love is not mm. the father of the baby. Mm. And the transfiguration, potentially, depending on how we read this poem, is that the baby becomes his. Mm. Could just be notionally, could be 
truly, mm. like genetically, it sometimes, somehow mysteriously happened. I, I didn't ever look at it like that, like a sort of transformation that, that's a, a sort of magical one. I just thought it was acceptance. So it becomes his, as in you will be the protector of the child. Um, what do you make of it? Because, you know, Schoenberg was a bit embarrassed by the, by the poem later on in his life. Well, he was 25 at the time. I've always wanted to say it in German. Ich trage ein Kind und nicht von dir. Ich gehe in Sünde neben dir. So I, I'm carrying a child and it's not from you, it's not yours. I go in sin next to you. Maybe that's the thing. I go in sin. When you're playing this music by Schoenberg, which is sort of the last thing he did that wasn't like crazy challenging with the music, do you hear the woman's voice? Do you hear uh, the look, man's voice? Because they... Question. No, it's all... It, 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 I had to go and really research it, except for the beginning. Um, so that if we remind ourselves that the two of them walking in the clear moonlight, then you, you, you can hear it, I think, in the music. Um, so as you hear this, the... This sort of very, very simple melody. Um, it's a kind of, um, you know, a, a musical notion that could come from any era, just about, especially folk music. Um, and then it becomes more complicated as the tragedy unfolds, his words. Um, and then, you know, you say, really? Is that what it's about? Except for a couple of things. So there's this um, exceptional key change. And what, what happens is that you've got E flat minor, which is as removed from D major as you could possibly get. Let's call it, you know, this tragic chord. And, and then at one cello holds this note. And then you have this incredible modulation. Duh. And then the cello, um, the cellos make this incredible transformation. And that seems to be the transfiguration <laughs> as you go into this incredibly positive second section where it seems to be acceptance. And I don't think there are any words that he put there, but now you get this. So it's just so simple, unaffected, artless, and, um, and, and somehow bright. And um, it certainly compared to this. This beginning, this, this sort of has this, um, it, it's got this sadness to it. Grief. And then the very end, he uses something which we now know very, very well in the modern world, which um, it sounds more difficult than it is, but uh, arpeggiated thing. You just, it's a chordal thing, like strumming it. Mm -hmm. And, but we can get this terrific fluttering affair. And Schoenberg finishes with that, And so we, we, during the credits, we have a little discreet nod to that because um, Sibelius, the great Finnish composer and symphonist, he, he wrote a lot of um, incidental music to, pl to plays. And one um, little piece that we play is called Quolema. And it's exactly the same from the Schoenberg. He, I don't know if he was reacting to it or not, but then what he does is the, you realise that the whole way it's aiming to this. And then a bell 
tolls and that's the bell of death. So it's the sort of opposite, tiny little miniature. It's the opposite to the Schoenberg. Thank you so much for all these insights. I feel like I know so much more about the music than I did before. Well, thanks for your curiosity yeah. and interest, Yumi. Um, and I really hope that you enjoyed this at home and that everything that you've heard, you can use to kind of enhance your enjoyment of the Australian Chamber Orchestra's studio cast called Love and Transfiguration.